All right, so uh, today we're going to conclude with the pipelining techniques. Uh, this weekend, I'll make sure I, I upload some sample questions about Chapter 4, uh, because by Wednesday, we're going to finish Chapter 4. And then starting from next week, we're going to start Chapter 5. In Chapter 5, uh, I think we're going to make it for memory hierarchy and cache, uh, cache caches. So perhaps, and then uh, I'll see where we can be at by the end of November. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. So, but, uh, but for now, uh, chapter four will be over on Wednesday and I'll upload some sample questions this weekend. Any questions be, uh, before we start? Okay. So, um, by next, uh, actually uh, two, two lectures ago, we started pipelining. Uh, techniques and then we were talking about different stages of pipelining in uh, risk 5 and then today we're going to discuss how we're going to first of all detect uh, a data hazard or control hazard and then how we're going to um, you know find a way in order to minimize the number of stalls or bubbles or no operations uh, in order to uh, have the highest speed up possible in our pipeline okay so for instance, let's consider this as a small example. We have um, a SOP and or and uh, add an ST, which all of them, for which all of them X2 was used, okay? So definitely without, uh, there are some hazards there. So let, let's see how we're gonna detect those hazards. And then later on, let's see how we're gonna forward, use forwarding in hardware in order to uh, optimize our implementation, okay? So now, if you take a look at these five stages, so each of these CCs are representing one clock cycle. So the first cycle, second, and it's going on, right? And each of them are representing one stage of the pipeline here. Let's see. So for instance, for the first line, for the sub, we have instruction fetch ID. This is the execution phase memory and write back okay the second line here you see beneath on, underneath cc okay is the value of x2 at the point of execution on that specific stage of the pipeline so here it was 10 all along up to the point that it was written back okay so the new value would become minus 20 at this point so you'll understand that after this point without forwarding right after only after this point we have the value the updated value of minus 20 we can use it later on however because of all these instructions all these that are using x2 in a way this and this or this add and this store so here we're going to have a problem because we're going backward we cannot use the updated value when it has not been provided by the right back of the stage, okay, without forwarding. Here also we had the issue, here also we had issue. But only the last one, without forwarding, we were okay. So we need to find a way to use forwarding to fix these three, right? Now, these blue uh, lines were the, uh, were the lines for which X2 was used, right? And we need to fix forwarding pass in a way in order to uh, minimize the stalls. And these red arrows, right, shows the forwarding when we implemented that, right, in a, in between X and MEM, and also on, on this case, between MEM and write back, so we could solve these two hazards, okay? So now let's see, um, let's see how we're gonna detect such hazards in order to activate the forwarding we have okay any questions so far so each of those in a simplified version we could have just written like this right and then carry on like this so each of them are like five Right, we want to use a value which hasn't been provided up to this point. 
So we use forwarding here and here for these two, right? This is fine out of its own. <coughs> yeah? So the forwarding here means just shifting the process by one state? No. Uh, so we'll see in this example. Actually, last session we were talking about those registers that are here in between each stages, right? Yes. So the intermediate results before passing along to the next stage can be forwarded using some control, okay? So we're going to see how we're going to use those here today, okay? First, we have to find a way to de detect a, a data hazard or a control hazard, okay? And then we, we go on to, uh, you know, write some logics to control that, okay? All right, so, so let's see how we're going to detect the need to forward, okay? So first of all, let's talk about a convention. For instance, this idx.registerRS1, right, is actually referring to the register number RS1 sitting in that pipeline register between your ID stage and your X, okay? So here. So id slash x dot register rs1 is actually rs1 sitting in between those two stages, okay? So on the example I just provided in the last slide, in the previous slide, so this was actually the case for x2, right? Because x mem slash mem dot register rd was referring to this register that we need to forward the, the result of x2 from, okay? So actually the first hazard in a sequence is on register x2, which I showed here, between the, the result of the, the, the sub instruction, right, and the first read operand of AND, which was using x2 and ANDing it to x5, and the result was in x12, right? It was actually here. So here. Between these two. Okay. So this hazard can easily be detec uh, detected when we when, when the uh, AND instruction in X stage, right? And the prior instruction is in MEM stage. That's why we have this notion of X slash mem, okay, and is is happening in its the first RS. That's why we are referring to as RS one. It could be on RS two as well, okay. All right. <clears throat> in general, because some instructions do not write uh, registers, this policy is not accurate because we we need to find a way to. Uh, you know, detect those that are writing to registers as well. So later on, you see that we're gonna we're gonna fix this and you know add some update on that. Okay, but so far is it clear how we're gonna represent that? So now we can generalize using this form of notation that uh, using a representative logic, if certain things happen, we need to forward. Okay. All right, so there is a forward control mechani uh, mechanism in, in pipelining and has some values, okay? The sign immediate as another input to ALU. So for instance, when we use 110, uh, 10, 0 is referring to a forward B operand between the stage X mem, right? The second ALU operand is forwarded from prior ALU result. So we can use this, this control notion using these two digits and A and B to, to define the source and the, the, the A and B, uh, whether it was A or B in the um, MUX control, okay? So now we're gonna see that. So here is gonna be the forwarding unit, right? So using those notion, 
we can decide which of them should be forwarded. Okay. Now let's go back and conclude it with the uh, detection process. So for X stage, if we want to understand the hazards happening at the X stage of the pipeline, so we need to simply write it down this way. One for the RS1 and one for the RS2. So let's just read it together. So if xmem.register write, so if the, the actual was a write to register, which we haven't considered it here, it was only read, okay? So we need to consider if it was a write or not, and if the value wasn't zero, and if this one was using RS1 for what A to 10, and we knew that for what A10, referring to this table is the second ALU operand is forwarded from prior ALU result, okay? So that's one condition. The other one, the same conditions, again, if it was a write, if, it, if the value wasn't read, uh, if, if the value was, uh, was going to get read wasn't zero, and then if the, uh, the, the number of register was RS2, we're going to do the same for forward B in this case then. So adding these two together, so this and this, we're going to define a forwarding case for X stage of the data hazard. Okay? Is it clear right now? Questions? All good? So, adding this control module inside your pipelining is going to be something like this, shown in blue, right? So, you want to make sure that you forward the results coming from this right to the previous stage because this stage is going to be used on another operation on the next you know stage of the pipeline right you are you're having only one hardware but each of those stages are going to get used at the same time so you want to forward the result to the next operation that is going to use that okay that's why using this control you're going to you're going to understand you're going to tell this uh, multiplexer that which of these A or B, whether or not you need to forward or not, or, and uh, which of these A and B should be forwarded, okay? So from this, you're going to forward the value here. It's as if looking back to the same first one, right? You're here, and you want to forward it backward, right, to this point, so that this stage will be using it. Right, but since this is the next operation, you're gonna you're gonna forward it this way. You're gonna show it this way, right? It's as if if you had one hardware, you're gonna forward it backward. Okay, does that make sense? So this x2, the value of x2, instead of getting ready at right back, we're gonna forward it right away here, so the AND can use that. Okay, so using this scheme. Here, we're going to forward either this using this multiplexer or this one. Okay, so that was for X slash mem forwarding case. Okay, sometimes also we have um, double data hazard because in this case we are adding this one, X1, 
and x2, again, we're going to add x1 and x3. So in both cases, we have a sequence of instructions with read and write at the same time are using s1. So we have multiple or double data hazard, OK? So in this case, since we want to use the value of x1 anyways, so we need to consider the most recent version of that, which is coming out of mem stage, not x, OK? So that's one exception um, for that um, pipelining. Okay, so the solution would be to simply check if um, if register write signal will be active or not, and we're gonna ex um, examine the the write back control field of the pipeline register during the X and mem stage, and we did, uh, determine whether that register write is asserted or not. So. If that was asserted, we're going to use the most recent mem stage of that instead. So that was for that was for x right hazards. Let's see how we're going to handle the the mem hazard. So for mem hazard, we need to consider one case, one extra case that is shown in blue. So you remember in in risk five. Um, risk five required every use of x0, right, the operand, the, the register x0 must yield an operand value of 0, right, because x, x, x0 was meant to be used as 0 value, okay? So we need to add this condition here so that we make sure if we were using x0 and the result were not x0, just use forwarding, so it's a hazard. Otherwise, we don't need to forward it because we know that it's 0, okay? Does that make sense why we have these two blue lines here? For the case of x0, right, we know that the value of 0 should be 0 always, right? So we need to consider the cases that if not, if it was not the case, we need to detect the hazard and forward. Okay? Somebody please raises his hand or her hand and explain this again so I make sure you understood this. <laughs> Can anyone explain why these two lines? So this actually half and half, right? This is for RS1 and this is for RS2. So you have this and this, okay? Does anyone know why we have this in blue? Why we, why we add this check at and not, right? Because the, the first this and this and this makes sense, right? If this one was register right and this one wasn't zero, and this one was RS1, we forward A, zero, and one, and we check the table, zero and one represents this, right? Yeah, sure. But my specific question is, if you understood this blue line, this extra condition. Did anyone understand? Why we add this and not x slash mem dot register write and register read wasn't zero? Hmm? Simply is the case that if an instruction in the pipeline has x0, right, as its destination. For instance, you had, um, you had add i x0, x1, and x2, okay? And we want to avoid forwarding its possibly non-zero value. We know that this must be zero, right? Because in risk five, x zero contains the value of zero. Okay? So if this was not zero, we don't have to forward it. Right? And not forwarding this will empty at least uh, one spot for, for compiler or the hardware to use it freely for other things. Okay? Because uh, it's, it's sort of an avoid of a certain condition 
that x0 was the destination and we know that it should be 0 and it wasn't. Okay? Does that make sense? Doesn't? Yeah, so so for memory, so for detecting the, the memory forwarding, so we want to make sure that either of two cases, either RS1 or RS2, so I'm just going to explain this one, okay? This one is the same, just instead of RS1, it's RS2. So you want to make sure that if, for the case that mem slash write back was register write, okay, we were writing to it, and mem slash write back dot register read wasn't zero, okay? It was it was something in it, but that zero wasn't coming from x zero because we know x zero is zero, so we don't have to consider it. And the case that it was RS one used for what a zero one. If the same thing was happening and it was RS two used for what b zero one and zero one for what a zero one and for what b zero one referring to the table here. So are these two, for what A01, for what B01, right? So we're we just trying to logically analyze when to detect a need for forwarding, okay, on each stage. So for X was simply these three lines. But for MEM, we need to consider also one in blue for the case that we were trying to use X0 and it wasn't zero, okay? Wasn't helpful? So all that blue line just means if the register is x0? Like yes, it's, it's, it's considering the case that, yeah, we were treating a zero which was meant to be not zero. It's just one x one exceptional case to have it more optimized. Otherwise, the rest would have considered the rest of the cases. So we just we want to avoid forwarding a possibly non-zero result, right? Okay. So adding this into the pipeline again, so that was for the previous uh, optimization, now we can add this. So you see at this point we have another control here that, that deals with write back mem and x. Going forward we're going to have write back and mem only and this one will forward it only to write back, right? So now this can handle this. The only case that remains now is the the load use hazard detection and that is done simply by checking when using instruction is decoded in ID stage okay and the ALU operand register number would be either this RS1 or if slash ID RS2 right and then we can detect load use hazard when these two conditions were simply happening okay in the register between id and stage dot register read if this one was rs1 or this should be rs2 actually this one this should be rs2 if detected we can install and insert bubble okay so even before warning we knew that we need to use one cycle stall for load because it's going to get written back after uh, the load, right? So we still, even with forwarding, we need one stall. We talked about it before. So in this case, if we add the forwarding case here, because the first one was load, even with forwarding, we need one stall, so one no operation, right? This NOP is no operation that is stalled.
Face or a style, okay? Excluding this, the rest should be fine, okay? So now adding all together now, so this was before these two, now we have a hazard detection unit, right, that completes the control check for, for warning hazards, okay? All right, uh, I also make sure I, I upload some, um, this sort of examples, this shape, so we can play around with different uh, optimization in a pipeline, with forwarding, without forwarding, and other, other situation, okay? So you get your hands uh, dirty with that. In exam, you might receive some questions. All right, so in general, we, we got the idea that the stall, uh, stalls reduce performance, but sometimes we can't help it. We just have to have some stalls, even with forwarding and optimizations. Because this one is load, so load instructions, after the, the mem stage, we can forward that, right? Because we are loading something. If it wasn't load, we could have just forwarded it right away here. Just like this in the sub. Here you see. The first one was sub. So our forwarding path was the red line here between the X and mem. Okay? So there was no need to stall it with forwarding. But if the instruction is load, because the result is gonna be at earliest available at, at this stage between these two, so the earliest we can forward requires at least one stall here, right? It's, it's only for load, yeah, yeah. The rest of the ALUs are, are gonna be okay from the, in this stage, okay? All right. So and, and, and uh, we saw that sometimes with rescheduling the code, either by hand manually or compilers can automatically reschedule the code in order to uh, avoid some stalls or optimize it to have, you know, fewer uh, stalls. Okay. The last thing that remains is how we're gonna take care of, uh, you know, uh, branch hazards. Okay. So now, these are the addresses. Right. Addresses of instructions, 40, 44, 48, 52, so on and so forth, up to 72, okay? So at this point, we need to decide either we're going to come back or we just, we're just going to leave, okay? So one way, in order to um, predict the branch outcome, right, is simply understanding how many instructions there were already here and, and without intervention, um, those three following instructions will begin execu uh, execution before branch not equal at location 72. You can easily compute that by just multiplying that to four, right? So here you know that at this point, if you wanna take the branch, we're gonna come back always this, right? So the branch outcome can be determined at the end of mem for us. Okay, so one way to reduce that branch hazard is to move hardware to determine the outcome of branch to ID stage instead of instruction fetch versus, right? This is much better. So we can, we can do that by just simply a, a simple math of PC relative branch and we understand that at 72 we need to fetch the, the next instruction after the branch, right? So we can do that right away at ID instead of instruction fetch. Because we sort of fetch the instruction um, by intervention, right? 
by out by by prediction. There are so many deeper um, uh, paradigms and methodologies behind branch prediction that that is outside the the scope of our course. So I'm just gonna um, quickly pass over here. Okay, but just um, you need to know that there are so many different ways to to uh, predict the outcome of a branch, either by static methods <clears throat> or by dynamic branch prediction, right? Or as I mentioned previously, uh, you can use the branch prediction by uh, a history table, right? So you see the frequency that each branch was taking before on that specific machine, and then use that as as a, a guideline to 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 take that branch, okay? And that's called a dynamic uh, branch prediction, okay? So, but but these things are very. Uh, if you want to go deep into each of these, it's going to take a long time to. Uh, it needs a, a, a course for itself. Any questions so far? Any questions for branch predictions? I mean, we sort of reviewed uh, very roughly, but any questions for pipelining? Anything at all? Like, just do you want to say something? <laughs> you make the exam easy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Your midterm average was very high, actually. You should be normal? happy. It was high. It was, it was around 20, 19.5, so it's good. 20 out of 30 is very high, right? Okay. More than 60. More than 60. 67, almost. Yeah, before the update of the solutions. Yeah, after that, it went up around one point. All right, guys. Um, so, on Wednesday, we're going to finish Chapter 4, and I'll send you, and I'll upload some sample questions this weekend, okay? So, see you in lab in half an hour. Okay.